Welcome back, everybody. We really live in challenging times. And probably the most challenging is after lunch. Um, you know, in the previous session, I, I did focus for a while on that revelatory moment when the connection gets made between, between Israel of the Bible and Israel of today. And you see them as part of the continuum and the, the faithfulness of God to his promises. Then you realize that God is still working the plans that he articulated to, uh, to Abraham, to Moses, to the prophets, to the kings. And this was, he's working his plans uh, through the apostolic age right up now to the present. And um, when that penny drops, the, the, the nation of Israel becomes like a, a, a biblical garden, a spiritual garden. And... Um, People come back uh, often uh, to, to, participate, to participate in that. So a number of years ago on Mount Carmel, we started a program that we call the Mount Carmel School of Ministry. And it's a 12-day intensive immersion into Israel through the eyes of the local believing community. So, um, you know, we, we, uh, you, you, you meet us, you celebrate Shabbat with us, uh, you, you come into the heart of a believing community, Jews and Arabs uh, and other Gentiles, working, serving, worshiping, praying together. Uh, and uh, we, we teach you what we understand about our calling and the vision God has given us. And then we begin to take you around our country. So it includes a site of the, of, uh, rather a tour of the biblical sites but, um, but a, a teaching tour, a study tour that's led by local believers. So uh, we found, we've done this for a number of years. Now we've run this school um, more than 40 times. And we found that, uh, that, that if not everybody, certainly the majority of people who come on this program, the penny drops for them, okay? And, they, and, and you know, we call it a school of ministry, but really it has one subject. No, on one purpose, and that, and that is to get people from, that, from the place of, hmm, Israel sounds interesting, you know, and of course it's in the Bible, and, you know, I wonder what it's all about, to, oh, Israel, you know, like, I get it, you know. And so, so um, just wanted to let you know that after we've, we've had uh, three years break and, uh, because of the pandemic, and we're starting up again. So the next one will be in November. So if, do we have any graduates? Any, anybody here has been through this? Well, look at that. Okay, so you've got some people who have been through the program, and you know basically what it's, what it's about. There are some flyers here. There's a website and, uh, and where you can access the, the, the schedule and some of the testimonies. And so I, I want to recommend this to you. For those of you who are wondering, what's my avenue into Israel? How can I make contact and not just be... Uh, uh, a tourist or one of the one of the, the big number in a tour that comes. Um, also, uh, this particular book is a pandemic baby. It was uh, uh, published last year uh, uh, from from Carmel, and it's about this foundational aspect of the revelation of Israel for the Christian world. And um, you know, I start this book with the conclusion. And I know some of you have asked me about this, and we've had some talks uh, uh, during the lunch break and, and afterwards about, okay, so, so what's next? Where's, the, where's the, uh, the, the new frontier, so to speak? Okay, where's, where's the, the place where the church needs to develop? And I would say that if you're wondering where to go next, the, the big area of discovery is in the area of discipleship. That to be a, a to, to mature more personally as a believer to the extent where you understand what it means to be a disciple of the kingdom and then what it means to make disciples of the kingdom. And so that after something like 50 years of, of being a believer and 40 of those years in, in active ministry, 35 of them in Israel, that's my conclusion that uh, I've come all the way around to, to the role of the church being a disciple making factory if you will. Our job is to, for the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, is to equip the saints for the work of service. And um, how we do that has to, has to do with, you know, our giftings and our calling and our location and the type of uh, people that, that we're dealing with. But that's really the, the product 
of, of the church. It's, uh, it's making disciples and, and specifically disciples of the kingdom. So I wrote this book starting with the conclusion. So the first section is about uh, being, being a disciple. But the rest of the book is how I came to that conclusion through the, through the revelation of Israel and an understanding of the kingdom of God, which is the subject of this, uh, this next hour. I'm going to talk to you about the relationship between Israel and the kingdom of God and what that has to do with, uh, with giving us a foundation for finding and uh, achieving our calling as individual believers, and then also what is the role of the, of the church uh, in society today. So I, I'd like to ask uh, for uh, your, your prayers uh, just for a moment before I launch in uh, to, this, uh, to this message. So Lord, we just want to commit these minutes to you. We ask, Lord, for your grace and your favor we pray that you will move by your uh, mighty hand and you'll begin to uh, reveal to us the nature of the kingdom of God. We'll uh, step into that kingdom and begin to access truths about our own calling, our own gifting, our own destiny uh, in that kingdom. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'll stir up the gift in me to teach and to use these minutes uh, with wisdom, that uh, there will be a clarity and I pray that you'll make our hearts like good soil to, that can receive um, not just the words of man, but what the Spirit is saying to the church, and that these, uh, these seeds of truth uh, will find good soil and be, uh, be able to grow and bear fruit uh, in the days to come. So we commit this time to you. And we pray this uh, in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Okay, so Israel's uh, calling... Uh, and, uh, and destiny in the Lord was to be a, a light to the nations. So Israel, the reason Israel, God created Israel was to be a blessing to all the nations of the world. And uh, God uh, outlined this when he created Israel from one man, uh, from this man named Abram, whose name he later changed to Abraham. Uh, and here's what he said to him when he called him. This is Genesis chapter 12, uh, beginning in verses uh, one, two, and three, the call of Abram. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Verse three, and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So this was God's plan. This was almost 4,000 years ago. And uh, what we understand from the Bible and what we understand from the current events of our time, God is still working that plan. And as I said in the previous uh, session, uh, the Apostle Paul underlines this. He emphasizes it uh, 2,000 years ago in his uh, uh, most important epistle of the New Testament. He said, speaking about Israel, the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. So Paul is saying, don't forget that God doesn't change his mind. All right? he, he is, he's perfect. He gets it right the first time. And, and what he says is truth. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said this to Abram. He's still working this plan today. He says, I'll make you a great nation, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, this has to do, I think, importantly, with our concept of the kingdom of God. And uh, maybe I should say a little bit about my understanding and how that changed over the years. I trained for the ministry in the United States, went to a good Bible school, and on to a very, very exciting and dynamic uh, seminary experience. And I, I told you a, a bit about that. But my focus was on bringing the kingdom of God to earth through the church. I knew very early on I was called to be a, a you might say, a ministry professional. In other words, my, my life, my vocation would be in the church, serving, you might say, in a religious calling. So I, and that, you know, I guess I didn't see it clearly like that professionally, but that's where I was drawn, and that became my model. I sat at the feet of great pastors and teachers. And, and tried to learn from them and later tried to emulate them. Um, one time when I was in, in seminary in 1979, 
uh, one of uh, uh, a, a young woman about my, my age, of course we were young then, <laughs> you know, said, uh, you know, she was the daughter of, a, of an Assembly of God missionary. Uh, and her father had actually started the Yoido Full Gospel Church in Seoul, Korea. And a man named Yonggi Cho was his interpreter. Okay, so, so she'd grown up in that church. And now she was in this church in Southern California. We became friends. And she said, you've got to meet this pastor from Korea. And uh, at that point, he had like a, a church of a thousand, a uh, hundred thousand. It was the largest church in the world. And he was coming to uh, California to speak at a full gospel businessmen's uh, conference, uh, you know, in the convention center, which was close by to the church location. And I said, come on, you know, how am I, how am I ever going to meet someone like that? You know, I'm a student. I'm just starting out. I'm hoping to get into ministry. I've done nothing. No one knows me. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to meet this guy. And she says, I've got a plan. And she said, you're going to borrow my father's car and you're going to volunteer to be his driver. And, and that's, what, that's what happened. So I volunteered and I was accepted and I drove this man around Southern California for a week. And as a result of that, we became friends. And what I found out, was really a really down-to-earth guy, okay? He, and he wasn't on some big ego chip. He was really very, very, very normal and kind and, and generous, easy to talk to and funny. He would make jokes about himself, okay? There was this, while he was uh, staying in, in Anaheim, there was, a, there was a, in the middle of the night, there was an, a, a fire alarm in the hotel and they all had to stand in the parking lot in their pajamas for a couple hours, you know, and it turned out to be a false alarm. There was no fire, okay? And he was joking about that and, and uh, make a long story short, years later, because, because of my focus, on the church and my, my, my desire to, to be a part of what God was doing to extend his kingdom through the church, I, I asked him and I told him I was going to Israel. Uh, we had a, a talk in his uh, office in, in Korea and he says, well, what can I do for you? And I said, I want to be on the board of Church Growth International because I knew by that time he had a board of 60 pastors from around the world and they met on an annual basis and he basically kind of mentored them in how to make a big church. And uh, in, in those years, his church grew from 100,000 until it was like something like 800,000. And, uh, and so he said, okay, you know, I think we, we can work that out, get some of the, uh, the guys to, to, uh, to nominate you, and we'll, we'll vote you onto the board at the next board meeting. And so for 20 years, I served on that. Long enough to, to learn that church growth, numerical church growth, the, the, the concept that we win the world by building bigger and bigger churches, it took me 20 years, and I'm kind of embarrassed to, to admit that, it took me 20 years to realize that doesn't win the world. And it, it really isn't very close to the biblical model that was embodied by Jesus and his ministry. So I, that's why I say I've come full circle back to what does it mean to be a disciple? And how do we get to be mature to the point where we make other disciples? You know, when I was a young pastor, I believed that my church was the kingdom of God. I mean, that, 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 and, and that was the result of just kind of, it wasn't like they just told you that in Bible school or in seminary. You just came to that conclusion. All right, and, and, and anyway, out in the world of ministry, the, the, the biggest parameter, even still today, the, the single most important parameter of success in, in, in the world of professional ministers, how many people come to that, how many people come to that one meeting two hours a week, right? The more people you have sitting in that room for those two hours is the single most important parameter of success. And I don't mean just in terms of your prestige and your standing in the, in the ministry world. It also has to do, as, as, as you well know, with income. Because that's when you take the offering. All right? And, and so the more people, the bigger the offering. All right? Sounds simple enough, right? But do the arithmetic, okay? When you, when you have small churches versus large churches in terms of the kind of resources and the kind of things that you can do and the th kind of 
influence that you can, you, the type of profile you can have in the world. So as a young pastor, I believed my church was the kingdom of God. My job was to get people out of the darkness of unbelief, out of the world, into my church. And the, and the way we did that was we wanted them to believe a, a handful of doctrines, maybe as, as, uh, as, as few as two or three doctrines, you know, the four spiritual laws. Let's make it simple, all right? You, know, you believe these four things, basically. You pray this prayer, and you're in. Oh, but you've got to sit on Sunday, because that's when we count your head, all right? And that, and that count tells us whether we're succeeding or not. All right, so, so more chairs on Sunday, more heads on Sunday meant it must be working. All right, so, so that's, that's what I believe. So, so if my church was the kingdom of God and my job was to get as many people out of the world and into the kingdom, which meant into, into, into my church, then, um, you know, whatever, whatever needed to be done, that's, that's, what, uh, that's, that's what we did. And... The goal was, okay, so my job is to make them all pastors, right? I mean, I'm a pastor. I'm committed to this, and I'm, I'm going to, uh, so why wouldn't they be the same? So they're, they're, they're going to mature. All of them are going to mature. They're going to become just like me. Uh, they're going to become pastors like me, and then when they're at, that's, at a certain point, we just send them out, and they do the same thing that we're doing, which is plant another church and... and and start putting chairs in the room. And when everybody does this, we win the world. I mean, it, this may sound really naive, but that's what I believed. And, and, and you'd be surprised. <laughs> you know, even, and maybe the cynicism comes in when we still do that, but we have ceased believing that that's going to win the world. It took, but it took me a long time to realize that only a handful, a tiny fraction of the people who sat in those chairs really had the inclination or the aptitude to do what I was doing. So every year, you know, it would be one or two or three or five people. So every year I fell so far short of my goal of making everybody a pastor and sending them all out to plant other churches that I, I was sure I was doing something wrong. You know, I wasn't praying enough or I just wasn't spiritual enough or they, you know, or they weren't, you know? Uh, and it took, again, it took me a number of years to realize, well, the reason they're not interested in being pastors is, is that God said, I just didn't call them to be pastors. That was, that was never my plan, all right? Uh, and and I, again, I'm embarrassed to tell you how long it took to, to get out of that mindset. But now that my mind has changed, I'm realizing that the ship is still sailing with those instructions. And so, it, so I, I, I tried to find out why, and I tried to, to, um, to come to a, more of a biblical paradigm for the kingdom. And this is, this is what I'd like to pass on to you. Most of us learn that the kingdom of God was Jesus' primary message. He starts his uh, ministry, Matthew chapter 4, repent, the kingdom of God is here. He, uh, it wasn't just him, it was John the Baptist, and this is the same message that he gave to his disciples. And he told them, my message is the gospel of the kingdom. He taught, he taught us all to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he emphasized this as the most important thing that he could pass on, the priority of his ministry. He said, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things, they'll be added unto you. When he taught the, the multitudes, he used parables, little stories meant to, to, uh, to use earthly examples to represent heavenly truth. So many of his parables begin with the same words. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. The kingdom of God is like a merchant who went seeking fine pearls. The kingdom of God is like a woman who put yeast in a lump of dough. The kingdom of God is like a man who found treasure buried in the ground. The kingdom of God is like a fisherman who threw his net in the sea. The kingdom of God is like a farmer who threw seed into the soil. Over and over again, the kingdom of God, of course, in Matthew, he's using kingdom of heaven. He, it means exactly the same thing, but it does give us a clue to the fact that the people that Matthew wrote to in his gospel were primarily Jews. 
I mean, even today, religious Jews don't like you using the word God, and they will refuse to use the name of God. You all, you all know this. That's why we say, Baruch Hashem Adonai. Blessed be the name of, and we substitute the name of God, which is in the biblical text, the four letters, yud heh vav -Hey, that, that some people might want to pronounce Yehovah or Yahweh. Okay? We don't know how to pronounce it because for so many thousands of years, the Jews never pronounced it okay? because they said that name is too holy for, for human lips to use on a regular basis. So we want to replace that. Every time we see the actual name of God in the biblical text, we change it to Lord, Adonai. In many of your English Bibles, English language Bibles, they follow the same convention out of respect for the writers of the scriptures, of course, who are all Jews. And so in your English Bibles, you may come to uh, this word Lord, L-O-R-D, written in all capitals. Okay, that's a clue to show you that really what's behind that in the biblical, in the Hebrew text, is the actual name of God. Religious Jews today, um, when they, if they're writing in English and they have to use the word God, they will write G-D. I don't know if you've ever had that seen words like that. In Hebrew, <laughs> religious Jews will sometimes deliberately mispronounce the Hebrew word and misspell the, the Hebrew word for God. The Hebrew word for God, the generic name is Elohim, and they will say Elohim. Okay, so there's deliberately, and the whole idea is to protect the name of God. And so that's why in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, you have kingdom of heaven uh, repeatedly, but it means exactly the same as the kingdom of God in all the other, all the other scriptures. So this was like the centerpiece of, of Jesus', um, Jesus teaching and his proclamation and his, um, and his, his preaching, uh, but so, so emphasized, so prominent, that many of us, myself included, came away uh, after studying the Bible with, uh, with the idea that the kingdom of God began with Jesus. He's the king of the kingdom. He comes along, you know, after Israel's long history, and now he's doing something new, and the new thing that he's doing is called the kingdom of God, and that means that everything we need to know that's important about the kingdom of God is in the New Testament. Because he comes along, he is the living word of God, his message is repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, he teaches, preaches, proclaims the kingdom of God over and over again, and we just, we, we think that the kingdom of God is a New Testament concept, and everything we need to know about it is there. That, that misconception has resulted in a lot of weakness in the church today. And it resulted in the fact that young ministers like, like, like I was believe that their churches are the kingdom of God. We, we either spiritualize the kingdom, and it's, so it's something coming, something that will enter after we're raptured, something that, that is uh, purely in the future, it's millennial, and it'll only be accomplished okay, in, the, in the future, or we, we make it purely religion, and we say, okay, the kingdom of God is just what we do as the church. And so it's, it's easy to go from that point to the conclusion that extending the kingdom of God is about church growth. But none of that is true. And I have said this before. Maybe some of you have heard me say this. That's like coming into the movie in the middle. And if you come into a long movie in the middle, eventually you find out how it ends. And if you pay attention, you'll figure out who these main characters are. But you'll never really understand why it ends the way it ends. And you'll never really have an insight into what's motivating. Why are these people acting the way they act? Because all of that is established at the beginning of the movie. And so it is with the kingdom of God. Jesus didn't invent the kingdom of God. He didn't start the message in, in Matthew chapter 4 when he comes on the scene proclaiming that it's now at hand. It starts much, much earlier. And when we get that early part, it, it completes the picture. And it really begins to help each one of us to have a foundation of finding our place in that kingdom and what it means to be a, a disciple of the kingdom of God. And, and if Jesus said, this is the most important thing, and he said we should seek this above other things, 
And if he said we should pray that this kingdom should come, I think it's important for us to understand what the Bible actually says about the kingdom of God because it starts much earlier. It starts, goes back to Genesis. It goes back to its part of the, of the calling and the promise that was given to Abram. But it becomes really, really explicit, really, really clear about 400 years after Abraham when the children of Israel come out of Egypt. Okay, so you know that this God called Abraham and it was uh, that call, that promise, and, the, and that um, covenant was passed on to his son and his grandson, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He had 12 sons. And then because of one of those sons, Joseph, they went into Egypt. All right, so I'm just compressing, you know, the book of Genesis into a couple sentences there, okay? But these, these stories are so well known to all of us. We know from the Bible that when they went into Egypt, they were about 70 people. They weren't a nation. They were an extended family. And you know, the thing about Abraham, this man of faith, he never personally saw the things that God promised him. He never owned the land of Israel. His entire life and the life of his son and the life of his grandson, they were sojourners in the land that had been promised to them. God promised him, you'll be a great nation. What did he see? The beginnings of a family. I mean, three generations later, there's still only about 70 people. All right, so, so he really was a man of faith. I mean, he deserves these, uh, the, the credit that is, is given, to, given to him. But when they went into Egypt, there were about 70 people. Not a, not a nation. They'd never governed themselves. They never owned the land that had been promised to them. And they were a, a family with a big promise from God. They're in Egypt, according to the Bible, 430 years. It says to the day. And by the time those 400 years were over, and most of it they spent as slaves, they must have been close to 3 million people. We know that, again, the Bible is very clear about the number of men of military age that came out. It was something like 600,000 men. They numbered the men of, of, of fighting age, 600,000. So you add the women, you add the children, you add, add the elderly people, and you get a number between 2 and 3 million people. So they, they were a lot of people when Moses led them out of Egypt, part of the Red Sea, and into the desert. Okay, now they're in the desert close to three million people. They've never governed themselves. They have no government. They have no army. They have no police force. They have no national infrastructure. Uh, who, they probably don't have garbage collectors. They were like, you know, they're, they're, they're hopeless. They're dysfunctional. They've lived for four centuries as slaves along the Nile River, one of the great rivers of the world, okay? They've, they've never known a life where they didn't have an abundance of water. I mean, that was the whole Egyptian economy, okay? It was the River Nile. Now they're in the Sinai Desert, one of the hottest and driest places of the world. Those of you who've been to Israel, if you go to Masada, okay, you, you, uh, down by the Dead Sea, you get a taste of what it's like, okay? But further south, it's even drier, okay? And so you know that in the summertime, finding shade is a matter of life or death. It's that hot and that dry. I mean, forget about water. I mean, don't forget about water, but first you need shade. <laughs> shade and then, <laughs> and then water. They don't know what to do. No one's, no one's trained them to live in the Sinai, and they're hopelessly disorganized. And that's when God approaches them and speaks to them as a people. And this is really important because basically from this point on, he disciples them. God discipled Israel in the wilderness to be a nation that would have a land that would be the people who would represent him on earth. And this, I think, connects powerfully to the words of the Great Commission when Jesus says all to his disciples, all power and all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. All right, that's what he's recorded as saying, Matthew chapter 28, okay, verse 18, 19, and 20. All right, we interpret that in our minds. We change that, make disciples of all the individuals, okay? But the only reason we do that is we came into the movie late, all right? But because that's not what he said. So disciple, we don't know. What do, you, what do you mean disciple a nation? How do you disciple a nation? Whoever did that? But God did. 
Okay? And that's why he waited until they were totally dysfunctional to take the plan that he'd, that he'd revealed to his friend Abram 400 years earlier to start it. Okay? Let me read what he says to the people of Israel in the desert. Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Okay, here they are, milling around, okay, wondering where their next drink of water is going to come from, okay, not knowing, uh, they know that miracles have happened, they know that they're free of the Egyptians, but free to do what? You know, where are they going to go? What are they going to do? This is, this is like the surface of the moon. I mean, if you've been, been out in the, in the Sinai. So God appears to them, and here's what he said. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. All right? Verse 6, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You will be to me a kingdom. What do those words mean? It means God is saying to these people, All right, today you become my people. I become your king. And that meant Israel became the kingdom of God. All right? And that's what the kingdom of God means. It means the people who are ruled by God as king. It's as simple as that. But the music should play, the credits roll, okay, the title comes up on the screen, the kingdom of God, okay, appears on earth. This is the people that God rules as king. All right. Um, and he says, you will be a priestly kingdom, a kingdom of priests. Most of the time we think, oh, religion, religious. They'll be a totally religious nation. But we think that, again, because we came into the movie late. If we, if we, if we knew what, had, what became of them, we'd know he only chose one out of the 12 tribes to be professional priests, right? Only one tribe. That's less than 10%. Oh, man, this solved my, my big question. Why didn't they all become pastors? <laughs> because I think that ratio is still in effect today. Less than 10% of us will be called by God to work professionally in the church as an organization. Okay, so that means the 90%. What do they, what do, they do? All right, and this is, this, is, this is the answer. It starts with this answer. It says, You'll be a, a priestly kingdom. Okay, what, is, what does he mean if it's not religion, if it's not just religion? Okay, religion is important. It's central, essential, but it's only part of the kingdom. So what does he mean by a priestly kingdom? Well, what do priests do? Priests are the people that stand in the middle ground. They represent the population before God. And they represent God to the rest of the people. So they take that, that, middle, that middle ground. They're, they're, they become the examples, the models. God works with the priests, and the priests pass that on to the people. And the things that arise among the people, the priests bring it before God. All right? And that's the role of Israel. That's why God wanted a people, and that's why he chose Abram. That's why he, he worked with Abram to create this people, because he says, I will work with one people group, and everybody else will watch and learn. And the gifts and the calling of God will never change. Israel, in your obedience, you will be a shining light as a, as a wonderful example of, of blessing to the nations. Israel, in your disobedience, you will be a powerful example of my chastisement and correction to the nations. And so it has been ever since that day. That's the story of Israel. It's not about superiority. It's not about favoritism. God says, I choose one, and everyone gets to watch and learn. I mean, why he didn't choose the Japanese people, I, have, I just don't know. I mean, I looked. I, I read the book, page by page, looking for the word Japan. And I found it not, no, not just, it's not, it's not just de-emphasized, it does not appear. And frankly, I'm still kind of angry about that. <laughs> but when I bring it to God, you know, you know, what about my people? Something wrong with us? You know, you, you, you created us, right? You, you love us, right? So, you know, 
his answer seems to be something like, well, Peter, you're just going to have to get over it. <laughs> I, cho I chose one, and, and you know, th that's it. You know? <laughs> you're watching them. And eventually I learned it was kind of like, you know, in my family, when I was born, my sister was already four years old. Okay? And now, decades later, she's still my older sister. You know, I tried everything. <laughs> But, but I didn't, I never, I never com really caught up, you know, uh, and, uh, but there were some things when we were kids that I learned never to do just by watching my sister's interaction with our parents. So many times, I mean, maybe it's just, you think it's just natural that, you know, she's four years older. So when we were, we were kids, we'd get into trouble and our parents would come and they'd say to her. Bad, bad, you should have known better. And some of the times they just kind of ignore me. You know, because the idea was, you watch and learn. Shut up, watch and learn. <laughs> and, and, and that's the way it is in God's family. God has many, many, many children in the nations. And he loves all of us with a redemptive, everlasting, sacrificial love. Only if you've been a mother or father or a grandfather and a grandmother or a grandmother, you know what I'm talking about. You love them all, right? Every single one of them. You know, the, the independent and, and stubborn ones, you know, who are a pain in the neck. And the sweet ones who are always so nice, you know, but you love them all. And God is like that. He loves all of his children. But in his family, one firstborn nation, one nation that he, that he created to be the example. And if we're wise, we watch and we learn. That's, that's what he means by you will be to me, a kingdom, I'm going to be your king. Moses was never king, right? Moses was the servant of the Lord, the prophet of the Lord. Who was king? God was king. And then he camped with them 40 years. Whenever they stopped, they put up the tents, and you, you know, it's all described, his tent right in the middle of the camp. God camped with them for 40 years. One of the things he did, and, and time won't allow to go into all of these things, and by the way, this is one of the things that comes out of really re restoring the Hebraic roots for the church. But one of the things that, that God did was he got the tribes to agree. You see, see, every individual is created by God. So God obviously has an individual plan for every human, past, present, and future. But individuals don't remain alone. We become families. Well, we know God has a family plan, okay? That's throughout the Bible, okay? God's working with families. Well, families grow. Families of families become tribes. God has a tribal plan. And tribes are very powerful. When the tribe decides, hey, Jesus is our king, you don't mess with Jesus. <laughs> the tribe, okay? The tribe is powerful. We see the, the negative side of tribalism, okay? The, the warfare, the, the racial uh, prejudice, and the, even genocide, okay? Uh, but, but we need to understand God created tribes for a redemptive purpose, and it needs to be turned around. We need to understand, listen, and we need to have a plan. How do you get the tribes to make Jesus the tribal leader? Because once that happens, it starts to form the culture. Culture is formed at the tribal level. Well, you might say it's maybe the family level, but really it emerges when, when you become a tribe. Then tribes have cultures. And culture is so powerful. Culture raises your children for you. You change the culture, you change your children. All right? And, and you, you can't just, you don't write off culture and say, oh, it's all demonic, it's ungodly. Well, yeah, it is, because we retreated from culture. Why? Because we came into the movie late, and we thought the kingdom of God was was our fellowship. And everything outside was darkness. So we weren't concerned. I, I wasn't. I was only concerned. My primary concern, I wouldn't say only, but my primary concern was that they came on Sunday and they prayed and they worshipped. And they listened. They didn't fall asleep. <laughs> All right? You know? That was my concern. And if that happened, and there were more of them on Sunday than were last Sunday, I could go home and pat myself on the back extended the kingdom of God. I was less concerned, far less concerned, how they lived their life on Monday. Just as long as they came back next Sunday. Okay? I mean, that was the life of, of, a, of a young pastor. This is the confessions of, of, young, of, a, 
of a young pastor, I realized that's totally backwards. The whole idea of getting them together on Sunday was to change their life so they'd be different on Monday. And if they were different on Monday, but different how? What, Monday, there's no service on Monday. <laughs> so what are you talking about different on Monday? I mean, this is the problem. When you come into the movie late and you spiritualize the kingdom of God, you don't have, an, you don't have a vision for your society or anything beyond the seats in the hall. All right, really. All right, I'm, I'm kind of over accentuating this, but I, it's, it's purposefully to kind of get this, this point home. All right. So he says, you're going to be a, king, a priestly, priestly kingdom. You're going to be my example. I'm going to be king. Oh, back to what, what did he do? He got the tribes to agree. They were 12 tribes. Okay. He got, and you could extend that. They were like 12 ethnic groups. All right. But when God was king, they all agreed that they would be one. That's when you have a nation. Okay. That's how nations are built. Nations are built when all the different tribes come together, or a good number of those tribes, okay, come together and say, we will be governed as one. That's what a nation is. And a healthy nation is when all the tribes in your land agree. Does that ever happen? It's an ideal. Okay, but isn't this what drives modern politics? What are we going to do about the immigrants? Okay, are they, are they a threat to the purity of our nation? And what, what happens in democracy when you have a vote? And so then this, this, this group becomes stronger because they have more numbers and they're put, or they're more organized. And, uh, this is politics, right? It's politics, no matter how you look at it, even today, is basically tribal. Come to the Middle East, all right? All right. Sometimes, sometimes people, in not so a nice a way, call middle, the, a lot of the Middle Eastern countries tribes with flags. Look at Africa. What happens in Africa? Okay, when the tribes don't agree. But God, when he was king of Israel, they agreed. And it took him 40 years. And when the tribes were as one, he took them into the land. Okay? So that, that becomes a kingdom, a holy nation. God starts with a national with a national definition, all right? He starts with the nation. And this is, oh, you miss all of this if you come into the movie late. That to God, your nation, that's what he intends to rule. And the question for the church is, okay, so how do we do that? And right away we should realize, well, we're not going to get them all in the room. <laughs> right? Right? It's just not going to happen. Even if we're not going to get them in, all, in the stadium. We, we've got to change our plan. That's doomed to failure. It just, mathematically, it can't happen. And of course, socially and culturally, it's not going to happen. We need a different strategy. But that was never God's plan in the first place. Okay, so he said, you're going to be a whole nation. Less than one-tenth of you are going to serve me professionally in religion. And the other 90%, what are you going to do? Everything else but you're going to do everything else as my people. You're going to be my possession. You're going to go out and you're going to teach that kindergarten class like my disciple. And that's why we come back to the picture of discipleship. How do we as a church produce people who go out from us able to really exemplify and be examples and a light to this nation? So we're trying to win a war, a cultural war, and a spiritual war against the powers and principalities that want to dominate this land. We're trying to win this war with less than 10% of our people. And we, we think it's successful if we can get really anointed and gifted leaders to speak to masses of people. And when, when, even when we do succeed in doing that and things don't change, we still don't change our plan. But that wasn't God's plan. He said, you know, I want you to be disciples. The apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, the professionals, ministers among you are for the equipping of the saints. You fight this war with the 90%, not the 10. All right? The 10% are for the equipping of the rest. And that's why you come back to the model that Jesus exemplified, make disciples. You've got to make disciples. 
We're not going to change the world. We're not going to make a dent in the, in, the, in the cultures of this world with a lot of low-quality disciples. All right? And that's everyone who has ever worked in manufacturing, you know what I'm talking about. All right? These days, you've got you to raise the quality. You're, 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 what you work at, what you produce, has got to be top level. You've got to be world class if you want to compete. And, that's, and we're the disciple-making factory of the world. Okay, that's what Jesus did, and that's what he called us to. You'll be a, a holy nation. Okay, time is ticking away, so let's uh, move on. What happened to, um, to Israel? And again, so much more could be said. There's tr tremendous more. Get the book. All right. All right. I did my best to put more of it in writing in the book. You can do more in writing because the uh, book, book is nice. You can read you know, a, a page or two and then just put it down. <laughs> come, come back later. You can't do this when you're speaking to a group. Okay? You've got to keep, keep the tension you know, and everything like that. So you've got to compress. Okay? But that's why you need to... You need to you need to read this. And then there's more, and God will begin to open doors, and you'll discover so much more. This is the new frontier. This is where the church grows again, okay? And, and almost counterintuitively, you don't make disciples in a crowd, okay? Crowds, big meetings, numbers are for making statements. Small groups are for making disciples. And you know, if I look back on my life, when did my life really qualitatively improve as a follower of Jesus? It was from my friends. It, was, it wasn't just any group, any small group. It was my friends. If we could figure out how to get people to disciple their friends, right? So that friendship and discipleship come together. And Jesus did that. Remember what he said to his disciples? You're not my servants. I call you friends. You're my friends now because the servant doesn't know what his master is doing. But you, I want you to know everything about me. And by the way, I command you to love each other because greater love has no man than this that he lay down his life for who? For his friends. Okay? That's, 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 the, that's the, the burning furnace okay, of the kingdom. It's when you have spiritual friends that you're drawn to, that you respect, that you love, that you would do things for, that you would sacrifice for, and, and, and people who feel the same way about you, okay? And when you're helping each other to be, to be followers of Jesus, man, discipleship is the, it just goes like that, and you grow. Most of us, if you're like me, got discipled by accident. Because we went to all those meetings and we stood in the lines and, and I have the handprints on my forehead. I could, you know, <laughs> did all that for years, okay, for years. But when I look back, when did I really grow? Friends, small groups, okay, people that I, could re that I trusted, that I would tell, I could talk to. How, how, many, how many real friends does, does a man or a woman have in, your, in life? It's a small number. It's a, it, and, and, and that's... That's discipleship. That is, is, is how, how the kingdom grows. Thank God Jesus kept turning away from the crowds. And once you see this paradigm, you'll see it everywhere. You read the Gospels and you see that he, he spoke to them and then he, he left. He could, have, he could have gathered. He could have made an organization. He could have built a mega, whatever, anytime he wanted to. And he keeps refusing, keeps turning back to these 12, 12 guys who become his closest friends. And then in John 17, he reports to the Father, they're ready. I'm ready to be glorified. I've finished the work that you've given to me. Read John 17 again. He says, I've accomplished the work that you sent me to do. Hey, wait a minute. Jesus, you haven't been to the cross yet. You haven't shed your blood as the atonement for the sins of the world. You haven't been raised from the dead yet. But you're praying that you've finished the work? What are you talking about? Well, read the rest of the chapter. It's all about his disciples. He's praying for his disciples. And in that chapter, he prays for us. He says, and I also include, I'm, I'm praying for those who will believe in me because of these disciples. That's why we're here. Because somewhere along the way, someone invested in you. And you got it. And you grew. And then sometime later, someone else, or maybe a little bit more here, a little bit. That's what I mean by accident. Most of us got discipled by accident. But if the church did it on purpose, if we optimized our organization 
to produce that, right? I mean, if we really worked on it so that our fellowships were so filled with friends, all right? First of all, you wouldn't be able to keep the non-believers away from that because they're so hungry. They're literally dying for genuine friendship. I mean, if, if we had something like that and we were producing people who knew what it meant to go out and teach the kindergarten or to, to work in the department or to, you know, to go and, and be a student or to build the house or to dance in this. And, and you know, if, if they knew what to do with their lives as disciples, our influence would just multiply month after month after month. And then after a while, the people that were, were impacted by the people that came out from us would start coming back to us, okay? And they'd say, well, I don't know what you believe. I don't, I don't know what's going on here, but I really like this person. <laughs> and I want to be like her, okay? How did, and she says, it's because of you. So that's why I'm here. What are you going to do with me? All right? I mean, that's a good problem, right? And, and so that's why I'm saying this, this is a paradigm shift. This is the Titanic being pushed by a toothpick, all right? The, the church has to make this turn. If we're, if we're going to make disciples of all the nations, if we're going to complete the Great Commission, if we're going to be the bride, if we're going to be the kingdom, because no matter what your eschatology, whether you think he's coming back tomorrow or in 100 years, we can understand he's coming back as a bridegroom to wed the bride, which is the body of all believers, spotless, without blemish, okay, shining with the, with the, the garments that, that are radiant, that, which are the good works of the saints. That's what, that's what it says. And we know that he's coming back as a king, and he's going to rule a kingdom. And on that day, every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord. Not just the church. He's not just coming back for the church. He's, he's going to rule it all. And we need to get that vision back again. Okay, so that started back in, in uh, you know, uh, Genesis and Exodus, okay? He outlines the plan to his friend Abram. Exodus, he starts to execute the plan. Okay, you're going to be my kingdom. I'm going to be your king, okay? And, and you're going to, I'm going to make you into a holy nation. It took him 40 years, and then they would go into the land. When they got into the land, here's what happened. I'm going to make this quick um, because, you know, it's a challenging time. <laughs> Um, when they got into the land, now they, they conquer, they settle, and for the first time, they start normalizing as a people. Now, they've, they're, they're unified. The tribes are unified. They have their own farms. They can plant. They can grow. They can harvest. They begin to prosper, and they're a, a normal nation, normal in one, abnormal in one important sense. They have an invisible king. All right, so, you know, according to the book of Judges, they got, um, they, di they didn't like that. After a while, the people, incredibly, the people of Israel grew tired of having God as king. And, uh, of course, we can imagine that it was, uh, it got, uh, you know, um, it, was, it was embarrassing and uncomfortable for them sometimes. I mean, the high-level foreign delegation comes to the border. What are the first things the foreigners are going to say? Take us to your king. And the people of Israel would say, uh, well, he's around here somewhere. <laughs> uh, but, but no, we can't, we can't uh, take you to our king because our king is invisible. You know, and so they longed, they looked at the nations around them, they longed to be like these other nations who had, you know, like silver jubilees and uh, platinum, is it platinum by now? I mean, this is amazing, right? And, and fine soldiers, you know, with the bearskin caps, you know, and, uh, you know, these, they, they, they looked at the other nations, and they said, these other nations have human kings and soldiers and palaces, and, and why can't we be like that? And so they went to Samuel, who was judging the nation at that time, and they complained to Samuel. They said, Samuel, you know God, you talk to God all the time. So you go now, tell him, we're unhappy with this situation. We want a human king so that we can be like the other nations. And Samuel, and I'm paraphrasing for the sake of time, Samuel said, that's not a good idea. Please change your mind. The first thing a human king will do is tax you. <laughs> Believe me, the 10% flat tithe 
It's a better system. Stick with God. And then he said, the next thing a human king will do is he will take your children for his army. All right, who do you think pays for those beautiful palaces? You do. Those are your tax shekels at work. And who are those fine soldiers in those beautiful outfits and everything like that? Those are your kids, you know, who previously used to serve at home, used to serve you and build the family. Now they're serving him because he's your king. Stick with God. Okay, stick with the kingdom of God. But they said, no, 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 Samuel, we're really upset about this. And finally, Samuel prayed. Here's the record of his, of his conversation with God. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 6. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. 1 Samuel uh, chapter 8, verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Okay, so in the days of Samuel, we rejected the kingdom of God. What did we get instead of God as king? Human kings. Now, in your Bibles, there are six big books about the, the human kings of Israel. First and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles. And as good students, good disciples, you've got to read all of them. Sorry. But for ICEJ in the UK, and because you've been here so faithfully all day now, I'm authorized to offer you a discount. <laughs> I can sum up those six big books of the Bible in one sentence. How many of you want the discount? <laughs> All right, three of you, that's fine. <laughs> Here's the sentence. They were a disaster. I mean, seriously, the kings of Israel made every mistake. They committed every sin that any human political leader can commit. And that's why they're in the Bible. All right? Uh, even as a negative example, Israel is still the example. Okay? It's, it's meant to instruct us the folly of following human leaders when it comes to the kingdom of God. Of all the human kings that Israel ever had, only one of them, except for Jesus, of course, but only one of them is considered a great king. Which, who, which king was that? David. David. Was he a perfect man? No. Far from it. Why was he considered a great king? All right, a man after God's own heart. Okay, But how did that manifest itself? How did we see him? I'll, I'll tell you. I'll give you an insight, and a lot of it has to do, of course, with his motives and his intentions. He always wanted to be the little king, so God could be the great king. He, he never wanted to take God's place. He, he, would, he was kind of the, the placekeeper for God, all right? But more than that, he was the only human king that could unite the 12 tribes, right? After, after Saul, the reign of Saul, who tried to kill him, David had the opportunity for his tribe, Judah, to wipe out Saul's tribe. But he had promised Saul, remember? Saul said back in, the, in, the, in En Gedi, when, when David spared his life, cut off the, the corner of his robe, but didn't kill him, Saul is recorded as saying, I know you will be the king of Israel, that you will not cut off my family after me. And David promised him. And also, because David's really deep friendship with Jonathan, the son of Saul. So when the time came and David had the power, he didn't wipe out the tribe of Benjamin. And when the other 10 tribes saw that, they all came to him at Hebron and they said, you rule over us. He was the only human king that the 12 tribes trusted enough to unify. That's a man after God's heart. And that's a, that's a parable for modern politics. Because so many politicians have found out if you divide your people, that can be an avenue to power. But the way of the kingdom is to you bring the tribes together. Okay? And only God's people really know how to do that. And when we really begin to do that, if any of you are called to public life or you're called to public service or civil service, okay, it's God. God will say, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'll give you power. I'll give you wisdom. I'll give you strength to bring that about. Look at Joseph in Egypt. I brought him to the top in the, one of those sinful, corrupt societies of history. How about Daniel in Babylon? Egypt and Babylon are biblical symbols of corruption, of sinful, dark, demonic society. And yet, God's people rise to the top. That's the, that's, that's the calling of the disciples of Jesus. God says, I'll make you, you do it my way, I'll make you the head and not the tail. 
But we don't produce men and women like that. Because you don't produce men and women like that in crowds. You, you want to get your young people to be people with that kind of stature, that kind of integrity, that kind of character. It's always done. Small groups. Personal attention. Someone takes a personal, I'm, I'm going to help you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it my business to give you what God has given me. It took 40 years to, for God to give me this. I'm going to make it my business to give it to you. Oh, boy. All right? Then men and women who are really disciples of the kingdom start rolling off the assembly line. Okay? And then we start to impact the world. That's why Jesus said, go and make disciples of all the nations. Okay, so we got human kings right after David. Solomon took the kingdom to its heights. Everything that God had planned, had, had, had promised, came to pass. He said to Abram, I'll make you a great nation. Okay, Solomon's, Solomon's kingdom was the envy of the world. Okay, he told the people in the desert, dysfunctional, disorganized, hopeless. He said, I'll make you the head and not the tail. Solomon, they were at, at their height. But Solomon's heart departed from the Lord, and after him the kingdom was ripped apart. Ten tribes in the north, two in the south. Civil war. Ten, the northern tribes never have a good king. It's idolatry. It's, it's um, political manipulation. It's assassination. They become so weak, they're conquered by their enemies, the Assyrians, taken into captivity, and they disappear to this day. Ten tribes, they're gone. The two southern tribes, they lasted longer because every once in a while they'd have a reformer like Josiah, Hezekiah, they try, you, you read about it, it's almost, it almost makes you want to cry when you see they're trying to bring the laws of God back, you know, to the, bring the God back under, bring, bring the nation back under God. And eventually they fail, and the southern tribes go into captivity, and for 70 years, God's kingdom on earth doesn't operate. That's why they wept by the rivers of Babylon. That's not just a good reggae song. <laughs> because they had been the kingdom of God. And now it was gone. They come back, a handful come back to rebuild the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. They try, okay, under Nehemiah, Ezra. It's not, I mean, it's, it's great that they came back, but it's not a triumphant return. It even says that, that the elderly people among them who remembered the glory of the Solomonic temple, they wept in disappointment, okay? It was a good attempt, praise God. But they were never free again. Right? It, they were ruled by pagan foreigners. They were ruled by the Persians. Then they were ruled by the Greeks. And then the Romans rolled in. And centuries passed. God didn't speak to them anymore. And I'm sure that there were like, there were like Jews who believed in the Bible, believed in God, and, and cried out to the Lord and said, what happened? Uh, and, and please forgive. What a, what a sin. What a mistake. What a folly. Our fathers, when they rejected, we were the kingdom of God. The only people on earth had God as king. And all we had to do was follow you. All we had to do was what you said, and, and it would have gone on. It was intended to go on for eternity. And we threw it all away. God, please forgive. But there was no word from God. There was no prophetic visitation. Isaiah said the people who sat in darkness began to see a great light. And then, after generations, a man arises in the Galilee, power from God, miracles. He can make the lame walk, he can make the blind see, he just speaks the word and, and things happen. He can multiply food for thousands of people, he can walk on the surface of water. The news about him goes like electricity over the nation. God has raised up a great prophet in the Galilee from amongst us. God has heard our prayer, a great deliverer, maybe the Messiah. But wait a minute. It was more than miracles, right? He had a message. He was preaching. He was teaching. He was proclaiming. What was this man saying? Well, it's very simple. He had one message. And it started with, listen, Israel, repent, turn around, change your ways. The kingdom of God is here. Okay, this is where we came into the movie. Okay? Of course they knew. Of course they knew. They'd been the kingdom of God. They'd been created to be the kingdom of God, and they'd thrown it all away, and it had destroyed their nation. But now this man, he's proclaiming it's back. It's here, and he's got power from God. They wanted to make him king. All right, so you see how this, the story unfolds? All right, I'm going to finish with this. 
just to, to, to make this really emphatic about how deep this was even in his own disciples who wrote the New Testament for us and who, who, who created the model that we still followed to this day after, after 2,000 years. In the last five minutes they spent with him, that's, that means my time is up. In the last five minutes they spent with him on earth, they asked him one question. Some of you know what that question is, some of you don't. Here's part of his answer to their final question before he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. Part of his answer was, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's part of his answer. What was the question? We need to dial it back. The answer begins in, uh, in uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Two verses earlier, Acts chapter 1, verse 6, here's what they asked him. It says, when they had come together, they were asking him, Lord, is it now you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? That was the most important thing. These men who had lived three years daily with the Son of God on earth, they had watched him die on the cross. They were personal witnesses of his resurrection. He, after his resurrection, he'd spent 40 days with them, teaching them about the kingdom of God. And now he's ready to ascend into heaven. That's the last thing they wanted to know, the most important thing they could possibly think of. Lord, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? 2,000 years ago, he said, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons. In other words, I'm not saying no, but I'm not saying when. If he told them it would take 2,000 years, I think they would have been so depressed that so he didn't say, he said, I'm not saying no, I'm not saying when, but this I will tell you, you will receive power. And it's no longer just Israel, now it's all the nations. Okay? All right. That was 2,000 years ago. Now, it's come around again. All right? And Israel is back. And the gospel is being restored to the people of Israel. If we asked him that same question today, you know what I think he'd say? Am I restoring the kingdom of Israel? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Because these are the end times. Okay? That, those words were written in Acts chapter 1 when the, when the work of the gospel going out to the nations was beginning. We're reading them now 2,000, later, 2000 years later as that work is finishing. And that's why Israel is so important. And that's why we need to restore the kingdom and we need a national vision. And that the, the church is God's instrument. The church is not, the church as an organization is not the kingdom of God. It is the instrument of the kingdom of God. The church, the role of the church is to bring the kingdom of God everywhere, starting with out there. And how do we do that? We make disciples. We become disciples and we make disciples. We find a way to produce men and women who know how to be witnesses. And what did Jesus say? Okay, that's great. And you will receive power. And you will be my witnesses. Okay? And, and, and that's, this is, this is the story of the end time church. But as I said before, sometimes I feel it's like trying to change the course of the Titanic with a toothpick. Because the church is such a massive thing and it's just tradition. You know, we just go in this direction. But he or she who has ears to hear let them hear, okay? And, it's, and you know what? I have a feeling God is going to do it anyway. Okay? With us or without us. But it would be better for us if he does it with us, right? All right. So may the Lord use, the, use those, those words as seeds and may you be very fruitful. May you become better disciples and grow. And may you make, get to the point where you start making disciples where God sends you a few people and you start saying, okay, yeah, I, I think I could do that. If, I think if you give me your time, I'll give you my time and I'll, I'll make it my work to impart to you the important things that God has shown me in my life. And we begin to sow into the next generation. All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you, you told us to go and make disciples of all the nations and you gave us that example. You did it and you just simply want us to do the same. And you want to use the bonds of friendship 
You want, you want to use uh, the, the people that, that we already love because you gave us that love. And the people that are, that are close to us, uh, we want to love our neighbors. We want to start with the people, people that, that we like and the people that we know and the people that are in our, in our families and, and the people that we work with, the people that we, that we golf with, the people that, that we spend time with. Lord, make us disciples and help us to help others to be disciples of the kingdom of God. Give us a great vision of the kingdom. Help us to go back and look at these scriptures from the beginning and, and test them. And, and, and study them and see if this is true. Is this what you want, Lord? You want my people to recognize you as king. It's not, it's not enough that, we, that our, our, our fellowship worships you. Of course we'll worship you. We'll always will. But you want my, our people to worship you. Help us to find a way to make that a reality in our time. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.